And we're back with the Intuitive Angel Internet Radio Program here on 24-7 The Stream. Here's truly Dave Enway along with Amy Bianc and our wonderful guest, Diane Bischoff-James, author of the best-selling book, The Real Brass Ring. And uh, the phone lines are open, folks, 1-800-653-1680, extension zero. Uh, If you have any questions, please uh, don't hesitate to call in and join the conversation. Just be sure and and, uh, turn down your monitor. (laughs) Okay. Well, The Real Brass Ring is available on Amazon.com, and it's also in Kindle book form, one of my favorite ways, so I can carry around hundreds of books just in my iPad. Um, And so please go up and check it out. I think you'll be very very pleased. I was very pleased to start reading this book. So one of the the things um, uh, Diane talks about is fear. And um, in all of the, I mean, I've been literally all over the world, and I've seen some pretty miraculous healings. Uh, One of the ones that comes to mind is a girl with no retinas who actually was healed and has 20-20 vision but still has no retinas, which you talk about weird. <laughs> but uh, um, the, the underlying factor in, in all these amazing healings has been a sudden release of fear. So I have a theory that fear um, is actually the underlying cause of maybe 95% of disease out there. So how do you feel about that, Diane? Oh, I agree with you 100%, uh, Amy, and I've, I've had the opportunity to really look at some fabulous resources that uh, Michael Lincoln's book in particular is, it's the Healer's Handbook, and this book is about, and this is the short version, maybe 400 pages, and it specifically will identify exactly what area of the body maybe is giving you an issue, trouble, pain, stiffness, and it will get into, which is so fascinating, exactly what it what issues were created that would lead to those that type of you know disease or disease. And um, I, I I had to get the handbook, even though it was kind of this giant reference manual, mm. because I kept finding that it was so amazingly accurate. It kind of goes on. Louise Hay, you know, started with that kind of work, but he takes it in detail. And once I was reading it, and I, you know, I was having trouble with my neck, and it said, um, and I'll just give you an example. It said, uh, you were probably a kid who felt like you had to dance for your supper. And I went, oh, yeah, I did. I was sitting here like, yeah, I did, Michael. You know, I mean, like I could just relate to everything that he was saying in there. And then once I realized it was because that earning love and, you know, it's like a lack of worthiness, uh, the pain starts to diminish and get softer and I can breathe into it. And so it was, I mean, there's all, and the the brand new book that's out, you know, called You Are the Placebo (laughs) is all about that. It's all about the fact that people who are getting well, whether they had the pill or not, the real pill, got well because they worked on their minds and the the wellness of their minds and they were able to actually get better than those who were taking the drugs. So I hope that this whole whole issue that we're that you're talking about you're bringing up it becomes a movement where we can really identify the body is the body doesn't lie. Right and 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 actually Peace starts inside of each of us. I don't think it's attainable if we're all running around filled with fear. Um, So one of your – there's a technique uh, that you've used that's called flipping. Um, And it's uh, similar to a Sufi technique that I've studied. But tell us about it because I love your take on it. Uh, Well, I've – one thing that might be a little helpful, there's a couple camps. I start with trying to identify what camp the fear is in. Okay. And one, for example, it's, they seem to fall in three buckets, and it's usually a sense of lack. And one is like a lack of self-worth. And that could be anything from not good enough or they're going to figure out I'm a fake or I'm going to get defeated. You know, there's, there's something in it about self that is not getting self-love, self-approval, and that, you know, there's something about lack of self. Another one that seems to be a big camp for fear is lack of means. Usually it's scarcity or, oh, my gosh, I won't be able to pay for my family or we're we're never going to eat again. They're going (laughs) to take our house away, you know, all those giant fears. And then, then the third one is lack of acceptance, 
which was a huge one I had to work with on the book, you know, fear of rejection, everyone's going to run away, I'll end up with no friends. Or, of course, you know, that's all part of the biggest underlying fear is, what if I end up alone? Mm -hmm. And so what I try to do is say, okay, what camp is it falling in? And, uh, you know, one example I'll give that helped me a lot is I had huge, huge lack of acceptance issues. If I write this book, because I came from a family of sweepers, (laughs) and we would sweep every single secret under a big rug and the rug was in the family room and it was See, like I knew you know, it we're 20... related <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's 20 stories tall you know and you never move that rug or for sure you don't lift the rug up because if you did all the secrets would come pouring out so um I went and kept writing about what you're not supposed to talk about which uh-huh. is what happened when we were growing up and how hard it is to get a divorce and what does it do to the kids? How do the kids feel about that? And what happens when you're a cougar dater and how do you lose the weight? And, and I wrote about the stuff that you're not supposed to do. So I think my biggest underlying fear and why it took me 10 years to finish that book is because I thought everyone would reject me. Mm. So what I had to do is first, first of all, I try to make the objectives extremely small really manageable so the first thing I had to do in order to try to finish this book was to say okay at first my goal was of course everybody in the world wants to be bestseller everybody wants to be on that list right the New York list and I thought no that's a crazy goal my goal should be if one person has a little bit of help a little bit of insight or can move forward in life one step then this book is is a success and it I have reached my goal so I made that goal so small that I knew that if one person would read it and like it and, and find it helpful, I was a, I was a winner. You know, so I had to change my, I had to really talk and keep that in a really small plate. And the second thing I would do is is that exercise of seeing the fear, seeing all the people with their arms crossed, you know, in the mind's eye, saying you know, you're a loser, you'll never, you know, you'll never make anything of this. And by the way, we'll never speak to you if you do it. And I have to walk through them in my mind's eye and turn around and face them. And then they would put their backs to me again, and I'd walk through them again. And they'd turn their backs. And every time I do it, they dissipate. Mm -hmm. And every time I walk through, and I, I see my body actually walking through, and I see how it's all smoky. And it's just this projection of fear in my head that that there would be this this massive level of rejection. And once I realized that it was just absolutely made up by me, and I had no idea what the outcome was going to be because we don't control the outcome of anything, do we? You know, we don't. We have no idea how it's going to turn out. There's always that meteorite. Yep. (laughs) We can't hold on. We don't know anything. We, We only can manage ourselves. So I had to let go of that rejection issue. And once I let go of the rejection and realized I would accept it, whether it came as positive or negative or anything else, and, it, and the book just ended. The whole thing was done like two weeks later. Wow. So it was strictly the fear that was standing in the way of me finishing this project. And how did that affect your health? Well, I had a lot of health issues, <laughs> a lot of health issues. And they all tied into muscular skeletal. Mm. I had, um, you know, bad back, sciatica, bad feet, bad knees. And the funny thing is if, you, if I went back and I kind of tried to relate the thread, and it was all about moving forward. Oh, isn't and that so, funny? Sure. Isn't that course. funny? It when kept you in place. Because you yeah. won't move forward. Yeah. So and when, when you, you didn't have the, you you didn't have the courage, so you invented the disease in order to keep yourself safe. It's perfect. Exactly. <laughs> you know, this is, ama- this is amazing. Did Amy, did Amy uh, coach you before the show? <laughs> Because I, for one, I'm a I'm a cougar dater <laughs> who who needs to lose weight, and Amy's got bad knees. So what's <laughs> so it's like you know, howdy neighbor, how you how you doing? Got to come over and have some chicken with us. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> God. Oh my goodness, we are soulmates. Yep, oh, honestly, no. D- Dave is our comic relief there. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was bored. Anyway, go ahead. Well, so- no, I think the cougar dating was probably the most enjoyable. I mean, <laughs> just because it was fun, it was just pure fun. Because when you take out, when you get rid of the objectives, you know, like you didn't have to, you didn't have to get married, you don't have to have any more kids, and you're just there purely to enjoy and have fun. That that's when it, that's when it's just you know the nightlife is there for you to just play and have a good time. So I mean I must say I hope you, are you having a good time with this, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> it's 
Well, it depends on what you define as a good time. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> boy, there's there's a million in jokes on that one, folks. But uh, oh, no, I'm I'm, I'm, okay. I'm I'm enjoying the heck out of it. Absolutely. Well, absolutely. One of the things I'm back from Dave. <laughs> Um, one of the things I see in the people that I coach um, is that this uh, uh, fear leads to um, a, a, a need to um, manifest codependence. So, so people do what I call date down. They they go um, and they find somebody who who they feel superior to. Uh, even though it might be a moral superiority or whatever, and and they think that then they can reach out and help them, and instead it becomes a giant manipulative circle. <laughs> yes. Yes. So yes. I, I I just was thrilled to hear about your your manipulative alcoholic <laughs> guy, Jeff. <laughs> Because really, it was archetypical. It and and on this journey, I mean, you know, you you have your you're a child, you become an adolescent, you become an adult, and then you become a codependent. <laughs> I, mean, I know, and I had to say, what's all that about? Honestly, it just seemed like you're absolutely right. It was people who really knew me said. Who are you and what are you doing? And this isn't the person we've known for 40 years. This is some crazy person who's here. But here's the part that was the trap. And that's what I love to look at. Like, where's the trap in this? I, I do believe with my codependent situation with the world-class alcoholic was that um, that individual showed me an aspect of love that was the warm, juicy, um, all the things that they taught. You know, we watch these movies. Just look at the notebook for one second. You know, it's all those beautiful sayings, and you're so this, and you're so lovely, and everything that you could hear about yourself that you ever wanted to hear was right there. Mm. And I didn't know it was even possible to have that experience of this full heart until I met him. So that was the aspect of heaven that was so attractive about the relationship, but then it came with this bucket of hell. and <laughs> The fallen angel syndrome, okay. <laughs> yes, and so I think that the addiction part, and to me so much of it is an addiction. I think we all have different parts of life that we're working on different addictions, whether it be for food or whether it be for I have to have somebody love me. You know, love without any boundaries and balance is sickness. And so I had to go through the, the horrible, horrible, horrible aspect of every part of life that's dark, dirty. You would never see an educated person going and sitting and, you know, going in trouble with the law and all that stuff that you only see on soap operas, you know. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and I, I was sitting there and I, it took me almost getting physically injured and my safety to really be at risk for me to say, finally, the rational self came back and said, all right, that's enough. We're done. You know, it, it took a dramatic issue. It took that rock bottom thing. And um, the only part that the part that is beautiful about it is that I don't know if I would be as healthy as I was today if I hadn't had the experience. But it still was one of the it was the nightmare aspect of life. And um, so, it, you know, it's really kind of funny. It's only hindsight when you're far enough away from it that you can say, well, I guess I'm kind of glad I went through that. But that was that was uh, that was horror. <laughs> Total horror and fear. Well, the the um, uh, one of our uh, one of the things that I believe is a, a basic, a very basic life genetic kind of in in your DNA thing is a fear of not being fed, not being taken care of, not not being part of the tribe. And when you set out in a in a completely different um, path. Then is approved by the tribe, right? <laughs> you you um, have that fear ra- raise its head, you know. Um, and I I see so many people who've lived alternative lifestyles, or who said, "Well, you know, I can be different. I can be a musician. I can be um, a, 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 an actress," because <laughs> I have a few actress clients. And um, but then when when push comes to shove. They're not so positive 
that they can actually make it without the tribe packing them a lunch, you know? <laughs> so. Oh, I, I agree with you. I think that is, you know, that's that ultimate fear of being alone because if the tribe leaves... Right. What if you got you can't you, you're going to die? You know, I mean, really and truly, it's that fear of death. So th- then, um, good old Jeff, the alcoholic, is standing, waving his hand. <laughs> hey, are you afraid? Well, I'm here, <laughs> and 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 it, and you go to it like a duck to water because you want to actually fix yourself, but you don't have the courage to do it. So you decide you're going to fix somebody else. <laughs> right. Right. And it's the. Um it's that feeling of, I, I think it's the uh, the eros, that romantic love, mm. especially if I'm going to say, I mean, I know it goes for men and women, but especially for a woman who, women who have had like a shut down heart, when the heart starts beating again, it is uh, uh, an amazing feeling and it creates this heightened sense of, you know, the whole oxytocin starts going crazy and you just feel love through every cell. And I, I think I equated love with saving him, and and not rationally, but if I love somebody this much, the bottom line fear is no one will ever love me like that again. Yeah. So this guy better stick around, right? So that's, then we go into all of our, our that's the, um, I, you know, it's insan- that's the insane behavior of being with something that would be so unhealthy and, and dangerous, uh, well, which what, some people do. One of the things I, y- you talk about is you're listening to your body, or listening to the danger signals of walking down the right path. Um, and I was really particularly uh, interested in that because in my own life, um, there's been some twists and turns. And um, it's it's not so much that suddenly I'm on my own, but I'm on my own with a gazillion decisions to make. <laughs> and the gazillion decisions I'm not used to, like hiring contractors and choosing furniture and putting granite countertops in and the things uh, I, I'm a, I, I sit down I meditate I own you know <laughs> and the and the contractor that comes to the door um, maybe I don't really notice that it's a gypsy <laughs> you know <laughs> So what what could I look for? What signal? What what thing could I look for to say that I'm on the right path and this is okay and hire this guy? <laughs> well, th- that's a great question. There's there's a couple of them. First of all, you know that little head. I always think of like the dogs when they go, hmm. You know, oh. when somebody says something that's strange or weird, it is strange or weird. <laughs> so I think the first thing I always look to are my ears. Okay. <laughs> if it quacks weirdest- like a duck. <laughs> People are always telling you what they're going to do. And I think that this is something that, especially American culture, we're always um, kind of whitewashing things like, oh, it'll be fine. Very often, we can retrace our steps. And, um, you know, if you ever watch some of those shows where, you know, I shouldn't be alive or I'm still alive and I shouldn't be, they almost always say, I heard something or someone gave me a warning or I do believe we're getting messages all the time. So number one is listen when either someone says something to your external world, but also listen, of course, to the internal world, and that is the senses within the body. Now, I think everyone has a different place. Mine comes kind of in the solar plexus, and it's a twist, and that twist will start going when I feel like there is something that is inauthentic, wrong, I shouldn't be doing it, it's not going to be in my best interest, or um, and, and it goes off really big and loud. I call it the radar detector. When your radar detector is going off, that's usually danger. And um, it's time to stop, turn around. I don't care where you are, what you're doing, you need to leave or get yourself out of the situation or manage it. And so different people have different places in their body, uh, but I think we all know what that feeling is. It's that twist in the, it's twist in the gut or twist, twist in the stomach or sometimes, you know, in the base chakra too, I think you can get kind of like weird feelings like, wow. But I, I, I just think it was um, just really odd that so often, um, you know, I'll, I'll ask anyone, well, when's, what did they tell you? She said, well, they said, you know, I'm not really the faithful kind of person. <laughs> you know, they said something <laughs> well, like that. What a sign and is they, that? Like, yeah. I've never really had just, oh, somebody once, actually a client said that their their significant other said um, that they had never been faithful to their previous wife <laughs> or other girlfriend and wondered why this person was also not faithful to them when there was that little passing remark that was heard but it was like, well, that's, that doesn't apply to me. Yeah. And, and 
I do ple- believe people are always telling you, unless they're really, really, really good thieves or something, really good gypsies, they're always telling you what they're going to do. And so I, I think it's just really raising, raising your awareness. And, and also the other thing is when there's a disconnect, and especially with a person like Jeff, he would say things and the story never made sense. You know, like there was always like A, B, and then F. And C and D were always really foggy and, and I would just let it all go instead of really following up and asking those really important questions. So if you're with a contractor, <laughs> do you have your license or do you have, you know, your ID or do you have the things that I need to see in order to make sure that this person is qualified? Or, you know, just really following up with all those four quadrants and making sure, because I think, I think we do get the bells and whistles. And, um, yeah. you know, you know, we just don't want to pay attention. Where, like, <laughs> think, like, don't go down the street. Have you ever had that one where you're like, I don't think it's a good idea for somebody once said, I don't think we shouldn't wear in New Orleans. And it was night and it was getting to be kind of late, but not, it was like 11, so it wasn't that late. And they're like, somebody said, I don't feel like we should go down that street. It's, there's something wrong down there. And I'm like, boy, I heard that. I'm like, boom, we're not going down there. And we turned around and went back to where all the people were. Later on, I found out that that was the number one place where people were getting mugged. Wow. Good instincts. Yeah, thank God. I was I was all over it. I'm like, oh, we're not going there. So, um, you know, that's where you just have to really kind of tighten it. Well, you know, it'd be in New Orleans if it was me. It would have been, ah, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go down that way. <laughs> We can handle anything. They would be so glad you went down that street later. For those I'm guys. telling you, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't too late, was it? It wasn't okay. <laughs> anyway, but hey, stick around, folks. We've got uh, just a couple, and we're back with the Intuitive Angel Internet Radio Program here on two four seven thestream dot com. What a hell of a station, I tell you what. Huh. Dave Anway, along with Amy Bianc, and our wonderful guest uh, Diane James, and. <laughs> <laughs> No, I got to tell you, that's always been the biggest fear of mine, and and it's kind of that um, I don't know. I guess the uh, the Jerry Lewis syndrome. I'm so worried about messing up people's names that I mess up their names. Uh-huh. So anyway, it's it's Diane. Well, maybe Bischoff, Diane can work Bischoff. on that with you. <laughs> Diane Bischoff James, of course, and the author of the Real Brass Ring. And uh, ladies, we got about five minutes. It's been a wonderful interview. Let's uh, well, let's finish one her of up. the things I wanted to ask you about is uh, this. Uh, uh, is, is actually divorce. And one of the startling statistics in the United States right now is that divorce for people under 50 is down at its lowest. It's around 5%. And I think that has something to do with the economy. Over 50, interestingly, and as a matter of fact, uh, coming at around age 60, the divorce rate's up to 70%, <laughs> which is uh, uh, just a startling statistic. But I think how you address divorce might explain it. So tell us all about that. <laughs> well, I have some theories on that. Um, first of all, you know, there's, there's, there's two sides to that. First of all, I, I think that our society has been um, somehow believed that, you know, everything's linear and that a relationship moves from A to Z together side by side. And I think the truth is that it can, and that that is absolutely wonderful if it does go in that direction, but we're waves, we're we're beings of light. And we all have a certain resonance and a pattern. And my theory is that these waves cross back and forth and in the relationship, and they have a healthy course. And then sometimes they, they veer off, and whether it's for pursuing life's work or whether it's for pursuing passion or whether it's just that, um, you know, whether it's just an incompatibility or whether it's just you're just plain old not happy and you need to find that resonant chord inside for yourself with another partner or not with another partner, but to find it within yourself. I think one challenge that, uh, and this is a theory that a lot of, you know, people might not totally have as, as something they would support, but I don't know why we can't celebrate the beauty of the relationship while we have it, but also the beauty of endings. Because what I found is that ending a relationship after 16 years, I could celebrate the 16 years of the relationship and say, beautiful children, we were functioning, we were two good people doing good things, but it was not a heart connection. And so in traveling off that path and trying to find a heart connection, after the marriage ended, I celebrated that ending with joy and just had a had time back to the Cougar dating talk. It was just fun to be able to meet new people and to um, and to just be the 
best part of myself, which I had not seen in 16 years, and not the trapped, stuck, made part of myself. So I wonder if that statistic is that we are seeking there's, you know, the best part of myself is in X situation, and maybe the, the harder part of myself or the part that I didn't care for, the patterns and the shadows were in the other. So I say maybe if the relationship either, you know, through healthy communication is not working, we celebrate an ending, and maybe that's what people are looking for. At least that's a theory that I have, just because I found that um, there was the beauty, the beauty, the love, the heart connection, the mental connection, and a much richness, greater richness after. So you, if I'm doing my numbers right, you got married quite young, correct? <laughs> uh, I was. I got married when I was told to. I was told I had to get married at 28, so I did that. Ah, uh, so okay. I, well, to me, yeah. that's really young. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I think it was 28, 29, and then um, and then we um, we started making our conscious shift after uh, after my son was born, so right after 40. And then we stayed in the family house together for about three years. So we had a very copacetic situation. We didn't want to lose the mini mansion, and we decided not to go in, into any kind of financial stress. And so we stayed there together and were single dating in the same family house for a couple of years. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, that is a story in and of itself. <laughs> Well, no, um, you know the 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 spiritist tradition, which I belong to, says that the people come into your life. Now, they don't uh, talk so much about the sacred bond of marriage and not to give it up and and all of that. But they say that until you've learned what you need to learn from the other, you might as well hang out together. <laughs> get that learning over with, you know, because the people come into your life for for a purpose and a reason. Sometimes you're the purpose for somebody else. Sometimes they're the purpose for you. But a, a, a union, um, it doesn't so much go bad. It just gets over. <laughs> right, right. It's that beautiful ending. Uh-huh. I mean, I, I don't know. Why can't we celebrate 16 years together? And And that kind of touches on the whole concept of sacred contracts. I mean, if you were with someone, I was with someone for 16 years and, and someone else is with another partner for 20 years, and I do believe the reason the statistic is so great now is that we are good people doing good things, and so as family members, we don't want to hurt the children. Mm. And so when you wait till you're about 50 and getting, especially at 60, pretty much the children are adults. They probably are healthy, they've been, as I say, released into the wild, and that allows, I was telling my daughter, you're released into the wild now, this is, we do it a lot later than most of the other species, um, so enjoy, and, you know, once they're off the that responsibility platter, I think people are saying, look, what about me, you know, and so I, I, I think, you know, maybe it's a, maybe it's a, a positive. Well, I do think it's a positive, and I think a lot of people are going to have experiences and be stronger the next time around because of it. And I think, Diane, you being on the show has been a positive. Thank you so much for ha- uh, being on with us, uh, and uh, continued success to you. Congratulations on all the big accolades happening with The Real Brass Ring. And Thank don't you. forget, you can just go up on Amazon.com. Type in The Real Brass Ring and you can download it. Or if you're a hardcover book person, you can do that too. (laughs) Or it's available in any good classy bookstore Uh as well. There you have it. So there, Diane Bischoff, James, thank you so much for being on the show with us. We'll have you back again, okay? Okay, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to be with both of you. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye.